Hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Esty, your host for our Colorado Bridge series, MAT in the ED. This is a series that takes emergency clinicians through the nuts, bolts, and clinical nuggets for treating opioid use disorder in the ED. We are proudly sponsored by the Colorado Hospital Association and the Colorado Office of Behavioral Health. In this third episode in our series, we'll be taking a crash course in the drugs used to provide medication-assisted treatment with our two opioid experts, Dr. Steve Young and Dr. Don Stater. So let's start out with a softball. What medications are used in MAT? There are three FDA-approved medications to treat opiate use disorder, naltrexone, methadone, and buprenorphine. And for this section, Don is going to provide the bread and butter facts about the drugs, and I'll chat later about their uses in addiction practice. Great. So let's start out with naltrexone. So naltrexone, better known, I think, to most by its brand name of Vivitrol, which is a monthly injection, is a mu receptor antagonist. So really, it behaves very similar to naloxone, but has a much, much longer half-life. You can use naltrexone for both alcohol use disorder as well as opioid use disorder. It comes in two main forms. One is a pill form, which isn't really used that much because it has major limitations, and oftentimes patients will stop taking it. And then it comes in a much more widely used form called Vivitrol, which is a monthly injection. There is one big rub to Vivitrol and really to a lot of MAT drugs, which is cost. And for example, if you are getting a monthly injection of Vivitrol, that is greater than $1,000 a month. Uh, Medicaid does cover that cost in Colorado. As a greater thing of how naltrexone works is it's intended by blocking the mu receptor to prevent the reward of opioid use and really to, through that, gradually reduce cravings. Um, Another few fine points to naltrexone is that a patient has to have completed withdrawal and really have been off any type of opioid for seven days prior to starting treatment. If you give it way too early, it, it does the same thing as giving naloxone does to patients, is it's going to precipitate a withdrawal, except the different piece of that is rather than naloxone, which lasts one hour to two hours, the naltrexone you give too early, if it's in a shot, it's going to last a month. And if it's in a pill form, it'll last 24 hours or greater. Um, so you really have to make sure that patients are completely weaned off opioids. There aren't a lot of patients on Vivitrol, uh, the num- and the numbers are still low. At our three clinics with ARTS, less than 1% of our opiate use disorder patients are on Vivitrol. We use it much more commonly for alcohol use disorder. One application that has been significant uh, for Vivitrol is in correctional facilities. Some patients opt for Vivitrol also after detoxing or completing an abstinence-based program. Uh, The problem with Vivitrol, of course, is that relapse rates are very high after you stop receiving the injections, and that's been a big concern for us. As a caveat, you will see patients on Vivitrol in the emergency department, just among your general population of patients. Pain management can be tricky. You have to overcome the blockade of the new receptor to use opioids, and this means using a very potent opioid like fentanyl at, a very, high, at very high doses, 6 to 20 times the usual doses you would use. Obviously, there are airway concerns with this, and you should rely heavily on ALTO protocols when treating these patients. The bottom line for the emergency department is that naltrexone is not a medication to be initiated. A quick question for you, Steve. Uh, can a patient on Vivitrol overdose on opioids? Yes, they can overdose on opioids if they take enough. And a lot of patients will do that. They'll try to overcome that blockade and they'll take more and more and more of, of, of a full agonist, typically heroin. And they can, over, they can overdose on their own. So let's talk about the first MAT drug, methadone. Methadone, the original MAT drug, also known as dolophine or methadose, um, well, has been around since the late 1930s. This was really developed at the end of basically World War II. And it's the gold standard by which all other treatments are measured. Um, so the things you should know about methadone is it is a full mu agonist with a very, very long half-life. Uh, the half-life of methadone is between 24 and 36 hours. When you use methadone to treat opioid use disorder, it's a once-a-day medication. 
And I think that's an important caveat because when you use methadone to treat pain, it's actually a three times a day medication. So sometimes you'll have confusion among providers about whether it's once a day dosing or three times a day dosing, and it depends what you're treating. In terms of addiction, the dosing is very patient-specific. Most patients need a maintenance dose of between 80 and 120 milligrams of methadone, but it's really broad, and you'll have patients who are on much more or much less. Uh, and lastly, when they do studies, they find that the effectiveness of methadone is not really correlated with serum concentrations of methadone. Nearly all methadone clinics use liquid methadone to deter diversion. You can't cheek the liquid. Believe it or not, some patients will cheek pills, walk out of the clinic, spit the pill out, and sell it. Interestingly, in most studies, methadone has a higher retention rate than buprenorphine. But many regard methadone as a second-line medication used for patients who fail office-based buprenorphine treatment. If buprenorphine doesn't work, the patient needs methadone. Methadone has a lot of stigma around it. Before I entered the addiction field, I also had a low opinion of it. But now, I see it as one of the important tools in our toolbox to treat opiate use disorder. The reality is some patients don't respond to buprenorphine, and methadone is their only option. Okay. So why is buprenorphine now preferred over methadone? Well, the truth is that methadone can be very dangerous. It is a full agonist and can cause fatal respiratory depression. Its respiratory depression half-life is around 24 hours. It has a slow onset of three to four hours, and people can get into trouble if they use another sedating substance after ingesting the methadone. That being said, the vast majority of deaths caused by methadone are from treatment for pain by prescription. In regards to the law, most ER docs should know that it is illegal to write a prescription for methadone to treat opiate use disorder. It can, however, be prescribed to treat pain. Methadone can only be administered in an OTP to treat opiate use disorder. You know, the one other caveat that all emergency physicians should know is that methadone is a very potent QT prolonger. So this is one where if you do have a patient on methadone, that you don't want to use a lot of other QT-prolonging drugs. You don't want to give them a bunch of Zofran or a bunch of Haldol or a bunch of Levaquin, all those things that can prolong patients' QTs. You just want to be more cautious with those. Right. And that, that QT prolongation is dependent upon the dose of methadone. The higher dose of methadone, the more you see the QT interval prolonged. The bottom line is that methadone is not a medication to be initiated in the emergency department. Steve, you said a moment ago that methadone can only be administered in an OTP. Uh, could you explain that acronym? What is an OTP? Certainly. Uh, before I be got into this field, I had no clue what an OTP was. So an OTP is short for Opioid Treatment Program. Uh, many times these are colloquially referred to as methadone clinics, but this isn't totally accurate because we use many medications to treat addiction other than methadone. OTPs are highly regulated treatment facilities which have intense oversight by the DEA, SAMHSA, and the, State of Off and the State Office of Behavioral Health. Treatment with methadone in these facilities is demanding. It's not easy. In the beginning of treatment, patients must travel to the clinic daily to have the methadone or buprenorphine administered. If they adhere to the strict rules of the clinic, meet all counseling requirements, and have UAs negative for illicit substances, they become eligible for take-home doses, but this process takes at least months. The clinics also have limited dosing hours, usually between 5.30 a.m. and noon. This is a problem for patients who must travel for their jobs. It's also a problem for patients who have physical mobility limitations and lack of transportation. The other big issue is that OTPs are only located in bigger population areas. There are several along the Front Range, but none in the Eastern Plains, and the Western Slope only has one in Grand Junction and one in Durango. Many Coloradans don't have access to OTPs. That's the simple truth. Dosing at the methadone clinic also means congregating with patients with OUD, and this has both pros and cons. A patient can find both support from others who share their disorder, but can also find triggers that lead to relapse. OTPs are best for patients with severe addiction that need either a highly structured treatment program or need methadone. Again, methadone for OUD can only be administered in an OTP. You cannot write a prescription for methadone to treat OUD. The other term that ED docs need to know about is OBOT, or office-based opioid treatment. This is where patients get a prescription for buprenorphine. This would include offices of some primary care providers 
general psychiatrists, and some dedicated addiction facilities. Usually, patients start out with a few days' supply and work up to a one-month prescription. OBOTs are far less structured, far less demanding. There is no absolute requirement for counseling like OTPs have. So getting back to treatment, let's talk about buprenorphine. So buprenorphine, which is most commonly known as Suboxone, but does include other formulations like Subutex and Zubsolf. And for a lot of us who work with this a lot, we lovingly just call it bup instead of saying buprenorphine. So bup. So you might hear me say this and might hear Steve say this throughout the podcast is bup from here on. Uh, Buprenorphine is derived from the opium alkaloid Thebane. And it was patented back in 1965 in England by the same people who brought us Lysol and Mucinex. In the 1980s, it was approved by the FDA for use in the United States. And the thing that's most remarkable about buprenorphine is the fact that it is a partial agonist. And that has some real significant clinical effects. So as a partial agonist, it has lower activity at the mu receptor. That means it induces less euphoria than other opioids, but still is a very, very powerful analgesic. And originally when it was patented, it was actually patented as an analgesic. Buprenorphine has a very high affinity. And what that means is that it binds extremely tightly, although it is a partial agonist to that mu receptor. And if you're using another type of opioid, such as heroin or morphine or oxycodone or hydrocodone, bup will actually kick that other molecule off of the mu receptor and really adhere more tightly to it. And in some cases, that puts patients who are on those drugs into withdrawal. The last thing is just like methadone, buprenorphine has a very long half-life of around 36 hours with different studies saying it's as low as 24 and others saying as high as 42, but 36 is what most people agree agree upon. And it dissociates very slowly from the receptor. Unlike methadone, which takes around three to four hours to really kick in, buprenorphine is effective within 15 minutes and it starts peaking at really one hour. So a very, very unique drug. And what does this all mean clinically? Well, it means that buprenorphine is a much safer opioid. Uh, Because of its partial agonist quality, it has a ceiling effect on respiratory depression. There's a point at which increasing the dose has no further effect. This is not true of a full agonist. If you continue increasing the dose of a full agonist, respiratory depression increases until there is a respiratory failure and death. There is no more respiratory depression at 32 milligrams of bup than at 16. However, bup can potentiate the respiratory depression effects of alcohol and benzodiazepines. Patients can still get into trouble using other sedating substances when using bup. Question for you, Steve. I have heard of cases of uh, kids getting into their parents' bup and being poisoned by this. For the opioid-naive patient or the accidental exposure, Buprenorphine actually can suppress respiration. Is that correct? It, it can. There have been case studies of people getting into trouble and, as, and with doses as low as two milligrams, but that is rare. Uh, number one, it by and large, it's a very safe medication. And, and in terms of pediatrics, um, especially with poisonings, these are great cases where kids behave significantly differently than adults, right? And that's true with buprenorphine, where there's a bit more respiratory depression. That's true of marijuana, where kids get coma and respiratory depression. That's true of clonidine, where kids get respiratory depression from clonidine. So the pediatric brain and how it reacts to different potential toxins slash medications is very different than the adult brain. So... Definitely when there's children around, then there's buprenorphine around, you have to make sure that you're hiding the buprenorphine or at least putting it in a safe place where children cannot access it. I think that was one of the drivers also of the switch in delivery method. Buprenorphine went from being largely prescribed as a sublingual pill to now having a pretty unique delivery method, which is sublingual. Is that how you're using most buprenorphine? Yeah, and there's a really long and sordid history behind that, Elizabeth, of why it went from a tab to a film. And it all had to do with trying to maintain the patent. But we will not delve into uh, drug company behavior. I think that's that's something we should talk about over a beer and probably 
uh, three to four day course of uh, how drug companies behave. So very interesting history. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, you did mention something very important, though. That is that buprenorphine or suboxone is mostly administered sublingually. And the major form, suboxone, is a sublingual film. Um, what happens if you try to swallow the sublingual film uh, or if you put it in the cheek instead of sublingually, it's not as effective. The bioavailability, if you actually swallow it, is only 15%. The bioavailability, if you just put it in your cheek, is 28%. And the bioavailability, if you put it under the tongue, is 50%. And this is so important that we instruct our nurses and our patients that you really have to put this under the tongue and leave it under the tongue until it completely dissolves. The other thing, let's just talk about Suboxone a little bit, is Suboxone is a mixture of buprenorphine and naloxone at a 4 to 1 ratio. And it comes in strips of 2, 4, and 8 milligrams. Colorado Medicaid covers Suboxone, but you have to get a prior authorization for that patient. There's also generic sublingual tablets and films that are cheaper and don't need any prior authorization. If you're looking to start Suboxone in your emergency department or BUP in your emergency department, one thing that many of us will do is not get the larger price Suboxone. We'll just get generic buprenorphine. And the reason for that is because it's a lot cheaper and you don't have to worry about diversion when you're actually watching patients take it. Right, Don. And you could actually get the monoproduct buprenorphine that doesn't have the naloxone in it. Is that what you were referring to? Yes, the monoproduct. That's exactly what we're referring to, Steve. It's much, much cheaper. A fraction so, of the cost. And that will, when you kind of go to your to your hospital and say, hey, we need to and we want to start a buprenorphine program, having a much lower cost will help us get past administrators. Tell me more about the naloxone mixed in there. What is that for? You might think that it would just counteract the effects of your buprenorphine. Right. That's a common misconception uh, that actually a lot of our patients have. Naloxone has a very poor sublingual and oral bioavailability. It's less than 2%. It basically has no effect unless injected. It's included only to prevent IV drug use. Patients have told me that using buprenorphine IV will give them a better high. There are formulations that only include buprenorphine without naloxone. The formulation I mentioned earlier that only has buprenorphine in it has a trade name of Subutex. It's used for pregnant patients because we don't know conclusively that naloxone is safe in pregnancy. But while sublingual bup is best in the ED, we should also talk about sublocade. Sublocade is a long-acting injectable form of buprenorphine. It's a subcutaneous depot injection given monthly. Patients need to be stable on the sublingual dose for at least seven days before starting sublocade. There's no risk of diversion, and like all depots, compliance isn't a problem. It has huge potential for the incarcerated population and would be a good alternative to Vivitrol. Like Vivitrol, however, it's very expensive. It costs over $1,000 per monthly injection. Colorado Medicaid has just started covering this medication. It's important to remember that buprenorphine can be prescribed for pain by anyone, but can only be prescribed to treat opiate use disorder by a provider that has a, quote, waiver. Okay, so now we're getting familiar with these drugs, but one thing that may be confusing is the legality of giving bup and the role of the X waiver. Can you clarify the laws surrounding bup? Glad to. So any provider can use buprenorphine in the emergency department to treat addiction. And if you are treating pain, you can actually prescribe methadone or buprenorphine as an outpatient. In addition, the DEA has a 72-hour rule or three-day rule, which further clarifies that buprenorphine is okay to use in the emergency department to treat addiction. According to the DEA, and I'll quote, the three-day rule allows a practitioner who is not separately registered as a narcotic treatment program or certified as a waiver data physician to administer but not prescribe narcotic drugs to a patient for the purpose of relieving acute withdrawal symptoms while arranging for the patient's referral for treatment under the following conditions. Not more than one day's medication be administered or given to a patient at one time. So you can't send a dose home with the patient, but can have the patient return to the ED up to three days in a row. Treatment may not be carried out for more than 72 hours. The 72-hour period cannot be renewed or extended. 
They can, however, come back to the emergency department in a week and have another three days. Yeah, and that's so important for us as emergency providers to understand, is that patients can come back for three consecutive days, and you can treat them very easily in the emergency department. And these are really quick visits after the first one. Really, after they come back for that next dose, it's a five, 10-minute visit. You put the buprenorphine in, it dissolves under the tongue, they walk out the door. It's the easiest visit any of us could ever imagine. Um, the other thing that people should realize is although there's all these contingencies about a week uh, before they can come back out, there's a lot of problems around enforcement. And I've actually never heard of an ER doctor being prosecuted or their license being challenged because of the fact that they started a patient on buprenorphine again after only four or five days. At the end, you're trying to do what's best for the patient. Um, so, in terms of the rule, I think it's all important to know. Right. And it's important to remember the DEA cares about one thing, and that's diversion. And if you're administering the buprenorphine in the emergency department, there's no diversion. The other option to having that patient that's not going to make it to an addiction clinic in the next two to three days is to give them a higher dose of buprenorphine. Yeah, and high-dose bup is something that's being pushed mostly by Andrew Herring in, in California, who, who started the ED Bridge program. And it's a really, really cool thing, which we're going to get into, I know, much more in our next podcast. So talking about terms, what is an X waiver? How do you get one? Why do you get one? So in terms of what the X waiver is, is the X waiver is what allows physicians, uh, non-addicted you know, board-certified addiction physicians to prescribe buprenorphine for patients with opioid use disorder. Um, so the important reason why you as an emergency doc should consider getting an X waiver is that one, it's going to give you a lot more knowledge about buprenorphine than this podcast will, although this podcast is a really kick-butt start. The other thing that's far more important than knowledge is it's going to allow you to better care for your patients. If you're in a community where you don't have um, follow-up for a week, you can actually just write the patient for a week of buprenorphine. The patient doesn't have to return to the emergency department. It's better for their pocketbook because they don't have all these ED visits. It's better for your ED flow because this is a disease process that can be easily managed with the patient taking a pill at home. So you're able to provide your patients so much more. I think there's a lot more of us who should have X waivers. So just to clarify, the X waiver allows you to prescribe bup from the ED. What do you need to do to get an X waiver? You have to take a course. Uh, they're usually eight hours. There are several available for free. So a free version would be from the Providers Clinical Support System, uh, or PCSS. That's a free, cor free online course. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association also offers a free online course. And, you know, we'll put these in the show notes for those of you who are interested in hearing about it. And there's one last caveat that I want to add, which is really exciting for us as emergency physicians, is that ASAP is partnering with the American Psychiatric Association to create an ED-based X waiver. Um, so if you've ever taken an X waiver course, it's got a bunch of crap in there that you as an ED doc don't care about. Longitudinal care, you know, a lot of things that you go through and you listen to and you're like, this is great, but has zero pertinence to my practice. And this new ASAP based X waiver will actually be 100% targeted to ED docs with good information for ED docs to learn and know about. Uh, Don, when, when will that be available? So the first one is going to be available in May and is going to happen around ASAP's Leadership and Advocacy Conference. And I'm sure that there's going to be a much more robust rollout of this program as this year progresses. And will this be a live training or an online? For right now, it's going to be live, but I'm sure it will go to an online platform mm -hmm. in the future. Final question for both of you, and one that might be a little controversial. Do you think that the X waiver should exist at all? My opinion is no. Uh, we commonly prescribe medications more dangerous and more addictive than buprenorphine. This gets back to the bias surrounding addiction, I believe. Yeah, and I could not agree more with Steve. The X waiver is an example of systematic bias. We do not have to have any type of special waiver to prescribe any other type of dangerous drugs. But when it comes to treating addiction, suddenly there's barriers to care. Uh, 
The X waiver is one of those barriers. The 72-hour rule, which dictates you can only give three doses, is one of those errors. And in a much larger sense, the fact that we put addiction in its own corner with its own protection under 42 CFR versus just integrating it into HIPAA is its own barrier to care. So again, that stigma has ways of representing itself. Us not using drugs, us putting all these rules around how you treat addiction. In a perfect world, this would just be a medical disease that we would treat and not have all these other stipulations placed upon it. I feel very strongly that we should get rid of the X waiver in the future. That reminds me, Don, of your uh, remarks about France and how France really turned its epidemic around by dropping all waivers and allowing all primary care physicians to prescribe buprenorphine. Thank you, guys. Five points to sum up. First, there are three MAT drugs currently used to treat addiction, naltrexone, methadone, and buprenorphine. Second, the only MAT drug really appropriate for broad adoption in the ED is bup. Third, buprenorphine is a partial agonist and has some very cool properties. It doesn't give as much euphoria. It doesn't produce as much significant respiratory depression. It has a quick onset and it's long lasting. And best of all, it can be administered under the tongue. Bup is often mixed with the naloxone for one reason and one reason only, to prevent diversion and IV use. When taking orally, the buprenorphine effect is predominant. When taken IV, the naloxone effect is predominant. Fourth, in terms of legality, you can give bup in the ED for up to three straight days to bridge a patient to addiction services. But prescribing bup or methadone for the treatment of addiction without an X waiver is a no-go. Finally, X waivers will allow you to prescribe bup in the ED, which is a great service you can provide your patients. Best yet, in 2019, ASAP will be producing an ED physician-specific X waiver, which will focus exclusively on ED-based care. Thank you for listening. I'm Elizabeth Esty, your host for Colorado Bridge Series MAT in the ED. Please tune in for our fourth episode, which will be a deep dive into the use of BUP in the ED. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in. You can find show notes, links to further information, and so much more at coloradomat.org. Please give us a visit.